you guys remember the story of Jesus when he's starting out in his ministry? And Jesus has begun to gather his disciples together, and he's starting to teach and preach in public places. But he goes back to his hometown. So he was born in Bethlehem, but he was raised in Nazareth. Jesus goes back to Nazareth, and he begins uh, uh, to start his ministry there. And what happens is when, when a rabbi would come into a place, they would often be invited to speak at the local assembly, the local synagogue. And, you know, maybe the synagogue, we have to think maybe a little less formal in some ways than we might imagine today. Uh, it might have been just a, a single room building in the center of town, or, or, or it might have met even in open spaces. And so Jesus arrives in town, and they know who Jesus is. He grew up there, and they know that he's kind of gone off and become, become a rabbi. He's become a name in a sense. They, they've heard some stories circulating of Jesus, and, uh, and he's back in town. The, you know, the homeboy, is, he's, he's back, and they think, hey, let's have him come and, and read the scripture for us today. And in Luke chapter 4, Jesus does just that. Astra, I am still not getting anywhere with this. Thank you. So we, we read in, Matt, in, in Luke chapter 4 that Jesus did return home, and that the word had spread about him. And then when he went to, on the Sabbath day to the synagogue, they handed him a scroll. Now, there's... Like in many churches that exist today, in the synagogue, there would be assigned readings. And so when they, stand, when they hand him a scroll, they're handing him just the reading for the day. There's, we don't have a sense that Jesus necessarily chose this reading, but I think we'll see very quickly that God chose it for him. So Asher, if we can get to the next slide. Um, he unrolled the scroll, and he found the place where it was written, and this is from Isaiah 61, The Spirit of the Lord is on me. Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, Today, the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now, it's hard for us to kind of put ourselves back in the place of the people who are sitting there that day. But if you've never heard of Jesus Christ, you, you've heard of Jesus, the son of Joseph and Mary. You, you might know the guy because maybe you used to play with him in school and after school. Maybe, maybe you even worked alongside him at some point, or you knew his family. And, you know, obviously Jesus was, by all accounts, a, a child who was esteemed even by others. Like, that's what we read in the Gospels, that even as a child he was looked well upon. But, but certainly you wouldn't expect Jesus to come back, open the scroll from Isaiah, talk about this Spirit of the Lord being upon him to proclaim good news to the poor and freedom for the captives and release for the prisoners and really to usher in, what does it say? The year of the Lord's favor and then say, hey guys, I'm here, it's me. Let's get this started. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what that would be like? I think most of us, if we're being really honest, we would think the same thing that everyone around him thought. This guy is crazy, and he's a blasphemer, and we need to get him out of our church. we got to get this guy out of our community because he's going to lead us astray. And that's, a, that's really what happened, is that, you know, it says they spoke well of him and were amazed at his words, but also he was rejected. He was rejected by his own hometown. The Bible said that he had difficulty doing any miracles there because the people had no faith. They couldn't believe. They had, they, in a sense, they knew the boy, but they had missed the son. And so Jesus left that place, and he did his ministry in other places. Now, in the end of, in the, end of the day, a lot of people from Nazareth, I believe, came to be followers of Jesus. But in the beginning, it wasn't like that. Now, 
this passage that we're going to look at in Isaiah today is the last of the servant songs, but it's the only servant passage that doesn't mention the word servant. But Jesus, Jesus is the one who makes it clear to us that this passage is indeed about him. Jesus says, I am the one who will fulfill these words. And so as we look at this today, we're going to see how Isaiah, or ultimately how the Holy Spirit, has orchestrated something really beautiful in this text to give us insight and understanding into who God is, who Jesus is, what they're doing, and then what we're to do. So that's going to be our focus for today, is to understand that. Now, I told you you were going to need your Bibles because um, we do have one more place to go before we jump into our passage, and that's Leviticus chapter 25. In Leviticus chapter 25, if you guys, uh, just to give you a little bit of background on the Old Testament here, is that uh, the first five books of the Old Testament, the Torah, they are written by Moses, and they give an account of creation. They give an account of uh, the calling of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, an account of their family being brought into Egypt, being put into slavery, and then being brought out of slavery by God's mighty right hand, miracles of God, to bring them out of slavery, and then brought into, initially, a wandering in the wilderness, but ultimately a promised land. And when during this time, God sets out the rules for what they're to be like. And really, what the five, first five books of the Old Testament is designed to do, it's designed to tell Israel who they are, who their God is, and what he's all about with them, like what he's doing, what he's called them to be. And so it's, it's really the foundation of them as a people. And in Leviticus chapter 25, I'm going to start reading in verse 1, but we'll catch up with the, what's on the screen there. It says, The Lord spoke to Moses at Mount Sinai, and he said, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, When you enter the land I'm about to give you, the land itself must observe a Sabbath to the Lord. For six years sow your fields. For six years prune your vineyards and gather their crops. But in the seventh year the land is to be a year of Sabbath rest, a Sabbath to the Lord. So he had already told them that in each week there's six days of labor and on the seventh day they rest. But he says, I want you to have six years of labor and take an entire year off. Now, I just want to ask you guys, how does that sound? Doesn't that sound good? Wouldn't you like a year off every seven years? I think that's a great idea. I think we should all do it. We'll figure out the money later, but let's like go ahead and put it on the calendar, right? And sorry, I'm still in my, still haven't got my new glasses. Uh, so he says to them, um, do not sow your fields or prune your vineyards. Do not reap what grows of itself or harvest, harvest the grapes of your untended vines. The land is to have a year of rest. Whatever the land yields during the Sabbath year will be food for you, for yourself, your male and female servants, and the hired worker and temporary resident, resident who lives among you, as well as for your livestock, your wild animals of your land. Whatever the land produces may be eaten. So he says, look, I don't want you tending. I don't want you working. I don't want you gathering. But just whatever comes, you know, let the animals have it. Your, your non-Jewish slaves can have it. And we're not going to deal with slavery today, but that was a reality in that moment. Um, and he says, you know, don't go reaping, but if it gives you something, fine. Now, what's interesting is that now we know all about things like crop rotation and letting the land rest. Like, actually, the land needs to rest. God knew, uh, but there was a spiritual reality to this. He says, I want you to be so trusting of me that you'll go a whole year without working in your fields, working on your farms, knowing that I'm going to provide everything you need. We talked about earlier with tithing. We're, t we're saying to God, I trust you. I trust you that I can give you 10% of everything I make, and you're still going to provide everything that I need. He's saying the same thing here. But then look what he says in verse 8. Count off seven Sabbath years. Seven times seven years. So you've got six years in Sabbath, that's one. Six years in Sabbath number two. Six years in Sabbath number three. All the way to seven. And then have the trumpet sounded everywhere on the tenth day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement, sound the trumpet throughout your land. Consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. 
Each of you is returned to your family property and to your own clan. The 50th year shall be a jubilee to you. Do not sow, do not reap what grows of itself or harvest the untended vines, for it is a jubilee and it is to be holy to you. Eat only what is taken directly from the fields. And in this year of jubilee, everyone is returned to their own property. And what he means by that is if you have been removed from your property, if you were poor and you had to sell your property, that in the 50th year, you get to go back. If you, have, if you have sold yourself into slavery because of poverty, in the 50th year, you're to be set free. If you have debts outstanding in the 50th year, they're to be forgiven. This is the year of Jubilee. And I just want to point your attention. I think we may, I, now I can't see what's up there anymore. But in verse 10, in verse 10, consecrate the 50th year. And look what it says. Proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. Does that sound familiar? To proclaim liberty, proclaim freedom. In Isaiah 61, when it says proclaim freedom, and in Leviticus 25, where it says proclaim freedom or liberty, it's the exact same word, the exact same intention. And what does it say to do? In the 50th year, so you've got, it's kind of crazy. In the 50th year, you have not worked on your farm in the 49th year because that's a Sabbath year. And you also don't work in the 50th year. You get two years off. Now, I don't know if anyone in here has been working for 50 years, but I think you deserve two years off. And so does the Lord. And so does the land deserve two years off. And so do the animals deserve two years off. And so every 50th year, the whole nation takes a break for two whole years. How scary is that? But God says in this passage, we're not going to read it. He says, I'm going to give you enough for three years of food on your, on your 48th year. So you've got food for year 48, food for year 49, food for year 50. And in year 51, when you're bringing in the harvest, you're still going to be finishing up the food you had from year 48. He says, I'm going to take care of you. But what they're to do is they're to sound the trumpet so that everyone knows that the year of liberty, the year of freedom, the year of release of the slaves, that it's coming. So now we're going to turn to Isaiah 61. And what I want you to see right away is that Jesus... Jesus is the horn. Jesus is the proclamation that a year of jubilee or a year of the Lord's favor is coming. In Isaiah 60, God is talking to his people Israel and he says, look, the way things have been, they're not going to be like that forever. He says, you guys, you've been in captivity. You're not going to be in captivity forever. You've, you've been working for others and not getting the benefit. It's not going to be like that forever. You have felt as a nation like you've had to pay tribute to other nations. It's not going to be like that forever. And I wonder how you are experiencing the moment that you're in in life right now. Maybe it's, uh, you know, you, you, you haven't quite landed the job that you know you, it's good for you. It's going to... Get, make the most of your talents and give you a great income. And God says, it's not going to be like that forever. Maybe you have those A or some relationships that it, they're just, you're just struggling to hold on to that relationship and keep things together. Maybe it's a marriage. Maybe it's a sibling uh, or a parent or a friend or a coworker, whatever it is. And God says, it's not going to be like that forever. Maybe your body, you feel like your body's betraying you. And you experience pain or, or difficulties health-wise, medically. God says, it's not going to be like that forever. He says, a day is coming. And he's talking to Israel first. But he's talking to all of us. He says, a day is coming when not only are you not going to be working for someone else, someone else is going to be working for you. You're not going to be paying tribute to other nations. The kings and queens of the earth are going to be coming bringing tribute to you. There's this kind of interesting thing. He says, you will drink the milk of nations and be nursed at a royal breast. What an image. 
says, the kings and queens of the earth are going to serve you. They're going to bring tribute to honor not only you, but honor the Lord into the holy city, city of Zion, Jerusalem. He says, God's going to do this. He's going to bring all the nations to you to honor the Lord. And he says, the Lord will be your everlasting life and your days of sorrow will end. That's Isaiah 60, verse 20. And then out of nowhere, God's talking like this to the people. And out of nowhere, all of a sudden, there's a new speaker. In Isaiah 61, verse 1, this new speaker says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me. The Spirit of Adonai Yahweh is on me. The Lord God, the one who brought Israel out of Egypt, the one who established the nation on Mount Sinai, the one who gave them both the law but also the blessings, And the promises of the Torah. The one who gave them the Sabbath years and gave them the Jubilee. He has put his spirit on me, says this new person. Because Yahweh has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. To proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. To comfort all who mourn. And provide for those who grieve in Zion. To bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. The oil of joy instead of mourning. And a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. And they will be called oaks of righteousness. A planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Who is this new speaker? Who is, whose voice is this? It's the servant It's Jesus. It's the Messiah. It's the one who's coming who's going to make all things new. And Isaiah gives us these little hints because I mentioned this is the only passage where the name servant isn't here of these passages we looked at. But the very first servant passage we looked at in Isaiah 42 spoke of the servant as the one who had the spirit of the Lord upon them. It's the same person. It's also the same person that Isaiah spoke of when he said the Messiah was coming. The Spirit of the Lord was on the Messiah. And so what Isaiah is doing here, he's linking all of the promises of the Messiah and all of the the promises of the servant. And he's bringing them together in one person. Saying this is one person who's both our Savior, but also the servant of the Lord who's going to be faithful and just and good. And he's going to give his life. We read just the last two weeks, both of them. He's going to give his life as a ransom for many. By his wounds, we will be healed. And so Isaiah, the the Holy Spirit, ultimately, is letting us know very clearly that the one who comes to save is also the one who comes to suffer. But this one who suffers is coming to bring good news, to bring freedom, to bring release to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And I think this is an illusion because it uses a lot of the same words. It's an illusion right back to this year of Jubilee, the year where all the slaves are set free, where all the people who've lost everything are restored to all the good gifts that God had given them. Whether you've lost your land because of drought or whether you've lost your land because of poor management, a fault of your own or no fault of your own, God's giving you back everything that you lost. It reminds me, church, of of the passage that's alluded to up here or referenced up here, Joel 2, where the nation of Israel has been consumed by these locusts. And the locusts have eaten their trees and they've eaten their bushes and they've, they've destroyed their vines. And so, you know, the curse that was on Israel was that they would go to the threshing floors where you separate the wheat from the chaff and there was nothing to thresh. There was no grain there to be eaten. They would go to press their olives, but there were no olives to be pressed into oil. They would go to make wine, but there were no grapes for the making of wine. But God says, I will restore to you all the things that the locusts have taken. The threshing floors will be filled with grain. The vats will overflow with new wine and oil, and I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. The year of Jubilee is God restoring everything that was lost. So guys, whatever path or whatever trajectory your life has taken that you're not pleased with, 
And I think most of us can look back and say, oh, in that moment, if I'd done things different, maybe it would have turned out differently. Oh, if this person hadn't done that, then my life would have been better. Oh, if only I had known then what I know now, then I wouldn't be in this place. But the promise of Jesus in this passage, as in so many others, is that a day is coming, and Jesus says we're in it. A day is coming where God's favor is unleashed, where God's grace is unfurled in our lives. He says, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. And I think, who are these poor? Well, we see in Jesus' own ministry that he talks about blessed are the poor and blessed are the poor in spirit. I think it's anyone, anyone who's in need of restoration from God. It's physical poverty. Yes, it is physical poverty. It's also spiritual poverty. It's relational poverty. Guys, we live in a world marked by relational poverty. I was reading something just a few weeks ago, and it was talking about men in our country today. And it said that uh, surveys from 30 years ago that on average, the average guy said he had two to three close friends, which it's not a lot, but it's two, three. And that today, the average is less than one. Less than one close friend. And because with social media and with the, the disintegration of a lot of, of, of um, unity in our country, politically, uh, for all sorts of reasons, we live in a time where we're relationally poor, a lot of us. And then you take into the fact that we've become so mobile as a society, and we often... I mean, I don't know how many of the people in this room are living anywhere near where you grew up, but a lot of us aren't. Some of us are. A lot of us aren't. And so we, 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 we live these, uh, uh, yeah, relationally poor kind of, kind of lives, and it's hard. It's hard to build those things back up. And he's talking about anyone. He's talking about release for the prisoners, freedom for the captives, Anyone who's captive by sin. By the way, the scripture says that's everyone without Christ. That's everyone. Captives of sin. Slaves to, to the desires that are within us that we don't even like. That draw us away from even our own attempts to be different kind of people. People who are captives to that kingdom of darkness we talked about earlier. From Colossians 1, it says that we are, we are captives of this kingdom of darkness. Jesus has come for all of them. Jesus has come for all of us, right? Because we are the ones who fall into that category. And Jesus is saying that the, the Lord God has anointed him to be this horn blast, announcing that something new is coming. So the, the way that your life is that you don't like, the parts of it that don't feel right, that, and I think each of us, as we walk through this world, we just think, ah, something is just not right about it. This is not the way things are supposed to be. And Jesus says, you're right. This is not the way things are supposed to be. There's a new age coming. There's a new time coming. Now, interestingly, Jesus in his, in his little, uh, in his reading that we, that we just looked at in the, in the book of Luke, as he reads from this passage, he stops before, he stops in the middle of a sentence. He says, he's here to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The rest of the sentence is the day of vengeance of our God. So we're going to come back to that in a minute. But Jesus, I think, is saying that I'm ushering in, I'm ushering in the grace part right now. That he... He's saying what's about to happen, because remember, the ram's horn comes before the year of Jubilee. It's announcing the year of Jubilee. Jesus is announcing it before it's inaugurated. But it's inaugurated when he is put to death on the cross, put in that grave, and then brought back to life, resurrected, raised from the dead. And in that moment, God inaugurates the year of the Lord's favor. And in a sense, we are living in the year now, still. It's what the Bible also calls the end times. We're living in the end times. 
We're living in the age of history where God is proclaiming to the earth his desire to free us from prison, to forgive us of our sins, to restore us to relationship to him, and to reconcile us to our creator through Jesus Christ. We live in that age. We live in that year. It's kind of like this long jubilee year where God is saying, hey, there's still some people who didn't get the memo that they're out of slavery. There's still some folks who didn't quite catch on yet that they can get their ancestral lands back. There are people who don't quite know that their debts have been forgiven. So let's extend this year until as many people as possible can get the news and respond in joy and then take care of the business of of redeeming and restoring and returning all that needs to be redeemed and restored and returned. And Jesus says as much. He's, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the New Testament says as much. The Lord is not slow in acting. He's not delayed. He's waiting so that more and more and more people can come to him and receive that grace and receive the fruit of those promises. So this is what Jesus, he stops right there to say, I'm doing this now. I'm doing this now. Now, in our, but our passage doesn't stop there. So you almost need, like if you, you know, you could take a pencil or a pen, right, in your Bible, and so just draw a line between verse 2, the first half, and verse 2, the second half. It's like everything above that, that's where we are, and everything after that, that's what's coming. And when is that coming? When is the day of vengeance coming? It's when Jesus returns. So Jesus is taking a nondescript hiatus, non, non-defined hiatus between the fulfilling of the first half of that verse and the second half of it. We're in an age of grace, but the day of judgment is coming. See, it's a year of favor and a day of judgment, a day of vengeance. So we're in this long season of gospel proclamation. But the time is coming when it'll be the Lord will be ready to judge. And he's going to do that also through this same person, through Jesus Christ. Jesus will be the one to return and judge the world. Now look what happens at the end of all this when it's all said and done. Because we, you know, if you were to read the previous chapter in chapter 60, God's saying, you know, right now it's bad, but it's not going to be bad forever. And then he proclaims this year of the Lord's favor, this year of Jubilee. But I, I, I think most of us who are believers in this room, we still look at our lives like there's still some things that aren't set right. I look around, there's still things in my life that I think, oh, that's not the way it's supposed to be. There's still things in my heart that are not right. There's still circumstances around me that cause me to grieve and mourn. So what's going to happen at this day of vengeance? Well, ironically, this day of vengeance is going to be for comfort to those who mourn. The purpose of the day of vengeance in Isaiah 61, verse 2, is to comfort those who mourn. Now, we, we have a hard time with stuff like this sometimes in the Bible. You know, our culture says, if God really was loving, then he wouldn't make us put our trust in Jesus and threaten hell to those who don't. Have you heard that before? Anyone? If God was truly loving, he wouldn't do that. If God was truly loving, he wouldn't make us go jump through these hoops to be forgiven. If God were loving, he would just let us do whatever we want. He wouldn't give us all these rules. Have you heard that one? My goodness, I worry about what kind of parents these people would be. You know, if you love your children, you just let them do whatever they want. I can't think of a better recipe for ruining your child. There's there's no better way. But but beyond that, think think of it this way for a moment. If you're in Israel, and you have been faithful to God, And yet there are people who have come and literally, I'm just going to be really stark here, have ripped your children in half in front of you. 
who have literally gone into your fields, stolen everything they can, and then did everything to ruin your field out of spite just so you couldn't grow anything there the next year. Who have literally kidnapped your family members who showed some promise. You remember people like Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego? They were kidnapped because they were smart and capable. So not only are they taking your children from you, but they're stealing the future of your nation from you. The most capable people are taken away, and the ones who are less capable are killed. And the ones who aren't killed are going to starve. I mean, we have a hard time fathoming that kind of situation. Some of you come from other countries where you have a better glimpse of that reality. And yes, forgiveness is important, and forgiveness is good, and For God to say, don't worry about any of that. Don't worry about any of those things that happened. Just forget it. Let's just pretend none of those bad things ever happened, and I'm just going to bring everyone to heaven. Can you imagine what would happen when you come face to face with the person who's done everything they can to destroy everything that you love, and nothing has been done about it? That's not good in loving. That's not righteous. That's not caring. That's not even gracious. God does something so different. What God does is he says, well, let me back. What that would be is if it would be like God saying, what you do doesn't matter. You're insignificant. If you're the most evil, vile person on the planet, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Your actions are inconsequential. God doesn't do that. Now, what he could say is, everyone who's done those evil things, you need to pay the price because you've earned the judgment that you're going to receive. And in a sense, he does do that. Everyone will pay the price and earn the judgment that they receive. But he says, but I'm going to give you an out. I am willing to punish someone else instead. I'm willing to punish not just someone else, but you know how you were ripping sons and daughters from families. I'm going to put your punishment on my own son whom I love more than anyone. So I'm not going to act as if your actions don't matter. I'm going to honor the fact that your actions matter so much that I'm going to provide a substitute for your punishment. I'm going to honor the people whose lives you destroyed And when you do see each other face to face in glory, if you put your trust in Jesus, when you do see each other face to face, there will be no sense of, God, how could you let them in here without punishing their sin? Because God will only need to point to the scars on Jesus Christ to show them that he did punish their sin. This is the most loving thing God could do. It would be unloving for him to erase judgment. It would be totally appropriate for him to exact judgment. But the most loving thing he can do is to, is to uh, provide a new recipient for judgment. And we have a hard time with that sometimes in our culture. But when you hear that, first of all, don't you be swayed. But you can also tell them, if someone stole everything you had, would you want a judge to just dismiss the case and let them go free? If someone killed your family members, would you want the judge to say, oh, you should be more kind and, and don't, don't hold a grudge against this person and just let him go. No, none of us would want that. But you have to realize that we are recipients of this great damage and harm and evil. And we're also perpetrators of the same. So we want justice because we've been harmed But to be consistent, then we should want judgment on ourselves. And God says, I'm going to provide the the recipient of the judgment. I'm going to provide this, this servant who will suffer for you so that he can provide comfort to all who mourn. So that everyone who's sad, everyone who's who's mourning, everyone who's grieving something that was lost 
can look to the servant, can look to the Messiah, can look to Jesus and say, in him it's fulfilled. I have received justice for the harm that's been done against me. God has poured out his wrath for the harm that's been done against me. And look at verse 3. And then he'll provide for those who grieve in Zion. And he's going to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. So ashes, if, you, if you're an Old Testament guy and horrible things happen in your life, then you put on sackcloth and you pour ashes over your head to show everyone just how miserable you are. Imagine doing something like that today. You know, one of the things that we try to learn in our church is that when we connect with each other, with each other we, we kind of share how we're doing, even emotionally. Like, we, we, we want them to know how we're doing, how we're feeling. If you walked up to someone and they had sackcloth and ashes all over themselves, you don't have to say, how are you checking in? Like, it's super clear. They knew how to communicate to one another where they were. In their heart, in the deepest levels of their heart, they knew how to communicate that. They literally would put ashes on their head. And Jesus says, I'm going to trade in your ashes, and instead, having ashes all over yourself, I'm going to put a crown of beauty on you. And I think a crown of beauty, it kind of draws up for us a couple of different ideas. One is this kind of royalty dynamic. You know, it's a crown. You know, and it's a beautiful crown. So there's this regal element, like God said, I'm going to raise you up, just like, I, just like Jesus was made beneath all, and God raised him up into glory. You who are downtrodden, I'm going to raise you up, and you're going to <laughs> nurse at the, at the breasts of, of royalty, <laughs> royal breasts. Again, like, what a weird but f- and fascinating image. He's like, the, the kings and queens of earth are going to serve you. I'm going to raise you up. But it's also this, it's a crown specifically of beauty. God's like, I'm putting beauty over your head. Where there was dust and cinders and ashes, and you know, not hot cinders, but just, you know, like little pieces of wood and dirt like this. Have you guys ever, like, you know, you clean out your fire pit or something and it's all that gunk and just imagine that all over you. God says, no, I'm going to put beauty on you. I'm going to give you the oil of joy instead of mourning. You know, when you're mourning and you're weeping and, you know, especially for women without makeup, men typically don't wear makeup, but, you know, when someone's been crying and you can just see it all over their face and you know, oh, they're not in a good spot. And Jesus says, no, I'm going to rub some oil on you to give you a glean and a shine. So when people look at you, they think, oh, wow. Looking good today. Looking good. And I'm going to give you a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. I think that garment of praise is relevant to, or, or is related to that, that um, sackcloth that people would wear. You know, why would you wear sackcloth? Because it's ugly, it's itchy, it's uncomfortable. It's, it's, not, it's not ideal for a garment. It just lets people know, like, I'm in, I'm in a bad place. Jesus says, I'm going to put a garment of praise on you. Like, you're going to be clothed in praise. Meaning that your heart is going to be so joyful instead of in despair, like the spirit of despair. It's going to be so joyful that you're going to be shouting out gratitude to me, clothed in this beautiful garment, with a clothed in beauty, oil on your face. He says, you're going to look like you're going to be the image of health and vitality and joy. Everything about you looked like the world was coming to an end. But when I'm done with you, everything about you is going to make people look at you and stand back in awe and say, that's an amazing person right there. That's a beautiful person. That's a powerful person. That's an esteemed person. Must be a king. Must be a queen. This is what Jesus promises. The vengeance, the day of vengeance is what brings this about. Isn't that something? And not only because our enemies will be defeated, and by the way, every one of you in this room has an enemy who needs to be defeated. 
Not only will your enemies be defeated, but the enemy within you will be defeated. And that you will come through this judgment unscathed. And not only unscathed, but exalted. What great joy there will be when not only does the judgment of the Lord come and your enemies are defeated, but the judgment of the Lord comes and lo and behold, I'm still here. And not only am I still here, I'm way better than I was before the judgment came. And sometimes we look at the judgment of God and we think, oh, you know, it's this horrible thing. We've got to get through it. But thank God for Jesus. And, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to like eke through by the skin of my teeth. No. The judgment is what, is what beats down, destroys, eliminates all of the things, even in yourself, that you hate. That you don't like. That you've been trying to get rid of your whole life to no avail because by your own effort, you cannot do it. And God says, I can do it. I know how to do that. I'm going to pour out wrath on my son. And you're going to be freed from all of it. Because judgment must come. A day of vengeance is so in... Uh, uh, the word is not, it's not instrictly, is it? Sorry, I'm having one of those moments. It's, it's, it's completely connected to the year of the Lord's favor inextricably linked. There we go. The judgment and the favor are inextricably linked, meaning you cannot separate them. You cannot divorce one from the other. And we want the favor and we don't want the judgment. And God says, no, you need the judgment. You need the judgment because that's where the whole grace thing comes to fruition. So you experience not just getting by, not just avoiding prison, but having this full release, this full freedom, beauty instead of ashes, joy instead of mourning, praise instead of despair. It only comes when God brings the grace and the judgment. And I think what Jesus was doing when he was preaching there in the book of Luke is he's saying, I'm bringing in the, the year of favor now, and when I come back, I'm going to bring the day of vengeance. And when it's all done, it's going to be so good. It's going to be so good for who? For those who grieve in Zion. Now, first and foremost, he's talking about Israel. But he's not talking about all of Israel. He's talking about a segment of Israel. The ones in Israel who still are crying out to the Lord. The ones in Israel who still anticipate God to do something good. Not the ones who've turned their back. Not the ones who've gone astray. But the ones who have said, what, you know, the, the, the idiom, come hell or high water, I'm, I'm linking myself to the Lord, whatever may come. Now we know it's not just for Israel. It's for all people of the earth who put their faith in Jesus Christ. No matter what may come, no matter what difficulties arise, no matter what persecution comes, I am going to live my life for Jesus Christ. I'm going to trust in him and what he's done and what he's doing and what he's promised he's going to do. And so no matter what else happens, I'm in his camp. And then may it be to me whatever he desires of me because I know it's going to be good. You know, I, we're not going to turn there now, but if you've read the passage of Isaiah 60, the, the chapter right before this and what it looks like, and if you go to the end of the story, to the book of Revelation, it's Jesus is bringing this heavenly city, this holy Zion, heavenly Jerusalem, down to earth. And it's all the things that are in here. He says, he says that, the, that all the nations of the earth, all the kings of the earth, they're going to bring um, in a procession, they're going to bring their tribute to the Lord. He says uh, there will be no crying, no sadness, nothing, because everything will be made right. Even in Isaiah 60, the sun will no more be your light by day, nor the brightness of the moon shine on you, for the Lord will be your everlasting life, and God will be your glory. In Revelation, at the very end, it says the same thing. There's no need for a sun, because God is going to be light for them. God will be, he will be their God, and they will be his people. And they will not even need a sun, because God's going to dwell among them, and he'll be a light for them. Jesus is the one who makes this happen, but he's expanded it beyond Israel and he's made it for the whole world. For the whole world who grieves and longs for the reign of God on earth. For the whole world 
who believes that the servant who's been given the spirit of Yahweh is who they should put their trust in and their faith in and believe in. This is the hope. This is the promise. But guys, without Jesus, when the day of vengeance comes, there's no way to escape judgment. And so here's the thing. We who have received the blessing of this gift, this ministry of Jesus, we too are to carry on that ministry to others. Remember, we've said all along, in the Old Testament, the Jewish people saw that Israel was the servant. But then Isaiah makes it clear that the servant is a person, a single person who embodies the realities that God is, that God is doing. Everything God's doing for Israel is going to be in this one person, Jesus Christ. And then after that, again, it is a people, but instead of a single nation, it's the worldwide body of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ. And if this is Jesus' mission, if this is his ministry, then it must be our ministry as well. And that's why we encourage you to go to things like the Send. That's why we encourage you to, to you know, invite people to church. That's why we encourage you to share the gospel. That's why we encourage you to pray, that tend to be prayer. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Lord, cast out laborers into the harvest field. And when you pray a prayer like that, I hope you're praying that God is sending you out first. Because every one of us has this ministry, the same ministry that Jesus had. When he said, uh, you know, today this is being fulfilled in your presence. He says, uh, the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Because he's there. He's the one who's going to do it. But he's not physically here now, but we're still in the age of Jubilee. We're still in the year of the Lord's favor. And so who's telling everyone, hey, you don't have to be in prison anymore. Hey, you don't have to be a slave anymore. Guess what? Your debts are forgiven. You know what? Everything that was taken from you is now restored. Who's going to tell them? The, the ram's horn has been blown, but not everyone heard and so now it's our job to go and share that good news with everyone else. Now, we're not going to pay for their redemption. Jesus is doing that. So we just point them, hey, there's the one. There's the one who will do it all. All you have to do is go to him, trust in him, believe in him. And if you believe, if you surrender your life, and by believe, it's not just like, oh, yeah, I like that idea, sure. No, it's a surrender then you get all the benefits that he's, that he's promised that he brings. And so church, take that last slide, Astra. Whatever Jesus has been doing is what we're to be doing. Right? Whatever Jesus looks like, we should look like. Christians are little Christs. Right? So Jesus is inaugurating this incredible season of grace, this incredible moment of salvation for all who are lost, for all who are spiritual needy. And it's our job to carry that message on until the day of vengeance, until the day of judgment. The Bible also calls it the day of the Lord. Until the day of the Lord, until Jesus comes back, you and I have a responsibility, but also a joyful calling to give really good news to people. Like, this, is not a, this is not meant to be a burden. Who, who hates giving bad, uh, good news? Who just, ha- like, I just hate telling people good news. I had to call someone with bad news last week. It's like, oh, I got to call them. I got to give them this bad news. I also got to call someone with good news last week, and I was like, I couldn't dial their number fast enough. It's like, ooh, I get to tell them the good news, you know? It's good news. It's good news. And God, he's letting us be the ones to share. So church, I pray and and invite you to take up that calling. Take it with earnestness, but not without joy. It is an obligation, but some obligations are welcome obligations. 
Not every, not every obligation is a burden. If you see it as a burden, I don't want you to feel guilty, but I want you to just pray, Lord, help me get a new perspective on this. Give me new eyes for what it is that you're calling me to do. And so I'm going to give you a moment right now just to go to the Lord and ask him. If, again, if you struggle with this, ask him for joy in it. If you're excited about it, ask him for opportunities. If you've got people in mind that you want to see free like this, pray for them. And then we're just going to close in a song uh, before we dismiss you guys with a blessing. So take that moment with the Lord. Thank you.